Hello and welcome to episode one of season two of My Friend Podcast with me, Paige Elkington. This is my first Zoom interview, so my apologies because I did not understand that on Zoom when one person is speaking, the other person is automatically silent. So there's a lot of me talking to myself and you can't hear it, but that's okay because I probably wasn't saying anything useful. This episode is with Jesse Gold. Jesse Gold founded Heroic Hearts Project, which is an organization that pairs veterans with ayahuasca uh, treatment for PTSD. Also, I uh, I spilled some green tea on my shirt moments ago, and I did not change. In this episode, I talked to Jesse about his own personal story, why he founded the organization what kind of results he's getting with the veterans completing his program, how drugs are classified, how to change public perception when it comes to drugs. We also talked about what PTSD actually looks like. I think for a long time, I thought that PTSD was like when someone, you know, held their friend in their arms while they were dying or was something super dramatic or super intense. Um, And that's not always the case. Um, It can be much more subtle than that. And so I think that was an important thing for me to learn in this conversation with Jesse. And my hope for this episode is that, uh, that that it helps someone. So if you know anyone who is struggling post deployment, someone who's experiencing PTSD, or you know, maybe doesn't even know they have PTSD and are just exhibiting symptoms of depression and anxiety um, when returning to real life, please share this episode with them and perhaps they could consider ayahuasca treatment. Please do your own research. I am not a medical professional, clearly. (laughs) I am not a doctor. I'm not even an expert in ayahuasca or, you know, veteran affairs. This is just a conversation between me and another person who I think is doing really, really great work for the right reasons. I made an active decision to not talk about, uh, my views on war or my views on the war on drugs in this episode i didn't think it was appropriate this conversation is about getting treatment for veterans i have a lot of respect for veterans but i'm also um anti-war if you feel differently that's fine we can all have different views again like i said the whole point of this episode is so that i hope that even just one person could maybe get treatment uh through ayahuasca after watching this If you like this visual style, like you like it being filmed, uh, let me know because up until this point, I've only done audio. So if you wanna listen to my other podcast, if you've never heard my podcast before, it is called My Friend Podcast. It's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else where you can find podcasts. Uh, I'd personally like to continue, you know, filming it. It's definitely more uncomfortable, but uh, yeah, I think it, it is a bit more interesting when you can see both people talking. Like it, subscribe, comment, you know the drill. Um, and then thank you for all the support thus far. If you want to find me on Instagram, my Instagram is my friend Paige. If you want to find Jesse on Instagram or Heroic Hearts Project, it's Heroic Heart Project. Hero- Heroic Hearts Project on Instagram. And his website is heroicheartsproject.org. Okay, I think... That's it. I'm going to go change my shirt. Tell me about what the organization does and just your personal story and what led up to you founding it. Of course. So my name is Jesse Gould. Uh, My background is I was an Army Ranger um, and I had three combat deployments to Afghanistan. And sort of a pretty common story is when I got out, I tried to adapt to civilian life. I had a background in finance and so pursued that. I was in corporate finance, which was a mistake in its own right. That's that's around the time, just, you know, the slowdown of life and all that kind of stuff that some issues that I had, I think, been successful or maybe not successful at ignoring and and avoiding uh, just really started affecting my life. And I just had that, you know, in, in ranger culture, especially just drinking your ass off every weekend and you know going for blackout and just partying all the time and even before work it was pretty common you know just because as long as you could get up and do a five mile run then you know you're you're good to go if you're functional army rangers they're 
you know, bread and butter is raids, uh, ambushes, airfield seizures, that sort of thing. So they're the, a very direct action, most elite infantry unit within the military. And so it's just a very high action uh, sort of unit to be with. But from what we were saying before, going from that to corporate finance and auditing financials, is uh, it's not the best, it's not a recommended course, I'd say. <laughs> um and yeah and that, that the the military lifestyle of of especially in relation to the drinking just doesn't work that well in the civilian world i mean uh, like for me i was still functional and it was definitely uh, there's a self-medicating side of it to where you know like when you're depressed or when you're socially anxious or whatever alcohol is always it seems like a good solution and it can kind of help you get through that 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 hardship and so i don't know i just found myself in a situation where there's always this dark cloud and just would have you know these these aspects of bad depression a lot of anxiety social and otherwise you know some po- points i had to call in sick to work just because i was so anxious um and just unhealthy in life in general uh and no matter what i did i couldn't figure out a way to get around it so i you know tried all, the, all the, the normal things of running, journaling, meditation, and just no matter what, it was just always like I kept hitting this wall. And, you know, you, you get to that point where like, I don't, I don't, I hope it, this is not what it should be. I hope there's, there's something outside of it, but sometimes you just get in that cloud where it's kind of hard to see from the outside. Yeah. So did, um, in your, you know, your military experience, did something specific happen or is, was it just that, you know, something that you really couldn't like pinpoint that was leading to these feelings of anxiety and depression? Yeah, for me, I'd say overall, I was pretty fortunate. I mean, there, there's always, you're always exposed to, you know, um, a very surreal side of the world when you're in combat and, you know, there are people dying around you and stuff like that, but it's not always like a saving private Ryan or anything like that. So I, I was, I was fortunate to where I, I didn't have, the sort of Hollywood style trauma, somebody dying in my arms dynamic to it. Um, for me, you know, what, what I actually had to figure out on my own is I was a, a mortarman. And uh, again, a mortar is a high trajectory rocket. And so it's like this tube that you drop a rocket in and the, the trajectory is like an arch. And then it's like an explosive. Uh, but within that, it's, it has a lot of concussive force, especially the bigger ones. And so myself and my platoon, you know, we're just constantly exposed to these blasts right by our heads because when it cut, when it, when it launches off, it's, it's that initial, you know, like being next to a, a anything that, that, that explodes, it has that immediate concussive force. Uh, and so what they're, you were getting drunk. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. What they're, what they're finding out now is that all those like even small concussive forces are even shooting a high caliber uh, rifles or even getting into like a minor accident, they all cause these sort of micro concussions in your brain. And a lot of that can actually lead to PTSD like symptoms. And what you're seeing that in in professional athletes, right? Like the, they call it CTE there. And just, Mm -hmm. you know, from childhood going on of just constantly something banging into your head, it, it changes the chemistry. It causes damage. This is a big issue in football, right? Yeah, exactly. Football, hockey, there's been a lot of suicides, just a lot of people struggling with mental health. And so you're seeing a lot of military. So there obviously is the psychological trauma element to it, but there seems to be more and more of this physical side that hasn't really been getting a lot of attention. And like I said, for myself, even though for four years, I was just constantly exposed to explosions, uh, not one person suggested traumatic brain injury or anything like and so it was you know dr google that helped me figure that part out which is you know a very surreal thing of me having to oh i probably have this you know it's, it's yeah. the web md internet yeah <laughs> yeah exactly so so to, to answer your question i i a combination of that that heightened stressful environment that you're constantly surrounded in uh but then with the added bonus of the possible micro abrasions to the brain over four years. Yeah, I think that's a, a helpful thing to to talk about because I think that kind of demystifying what PTSD is is important because, 
you know, for a long time, I thought of it to be, you know, when you witness someone dying or, you know, something really traumatic happens, but it seems that just the experience in itself can, is so surreal. And so not what we experience, like, in our everyday lives here that it can lead to just like more subtle symptoms. Um, so I can see why people would get confused as to, you know, thinking, do I need treatment or do I not? Yeah. And there's, there's obviously like a stigma behind it too. You know, obviously there, especially in the certain community, like special operations or is still that kind of alpha or machismo, you know, like, you know, even I had it to some degree of like, Oh, I'm, I'm fine. I was a ranger. Like I can handle this. You know, why, why would I be affected by mental health kind of things? Interesting. Yeah. I guess in my peer group, that is not the case. Like everyone, <laughs> but I have to remember that. Yeah. I guess there is still such a huge stigma around, well, definitely mental health, but yeah, getting help. People have problems getting help when they need it. Yeah. I mean, and it's hard just like, if you don't, a lot of people that I've come across that have severe depression, it almost took a diagnosis for them to realize that they had it. You know, I had a friend that was bipolar and he said one of the best days for him was that the doctor diagnosed him with that. And he's like, Oh, this is wonderful. Like that finally explains all my issues. You know, if you don't have the, the, you know, we're not doctors. So if you, if you lived your whole life experiencing this, then how are you to know that that's not the right way? You're just struggling, right? Totally. And that's not just a thing for veterans. That's a thing for everyone. Yeah. So tell me more about your foundation, the Heroic Hearts Project. So what's your, what's the the mission? What do you guys try to do for veterans? Yeah. So, you know, it came out of inspiration of my own journey. Like I said, I was at that spot and out of necessity, I heard about ayahuasca. I came in like a lot of people, you know, what I, I kind of say a lot, like from the dare generation of just saying it drugs and if you're yeah. doing drugs and you're probably a bad person and all that. So I had that, you know, in my head. And when I heard about this powerful psychedelic, I just thought as many people do of like, Oh, that's whatever for these people, not for me. But I was at that point of necessity. And fortunately I did, I took that leap of faith and, and went there. Uh, and ayahuasca in particular uh, really affected me. Uh, it felt like it changed almost certain dynamics in my brain and just had a lot of, revelations that really helped me regain my life in a lot of ways. And I saw these amazing stories. And just from that experience that I had in Peru, it was the inspiration of heroic hearts of like, I don't know if this is for everybody. uh, And I don't know how many people can actually help. Maybe I'm an odd case, but even if it can help a couple of guys that I know are struggling that are in that same boat uh, that, you know, may maybe aren't working with like tradition, like the accepted therapies, then let's at least give them information. Let's at least provide them the means to explore this and possibly connect it in as safe a way as possible. And so that's where Heroic Hearts Project came from. Uh, And, you know, we're a registered nonprofit within the U.S. And it is really providing information to veterans or whoever wants it and then connecting them to ayahuasca and other psychedelic therapies and providing a whole sort of program of support, which, you know, starts at the beginning in terms of preparation, uh, pre-integration, uh, vetting the retreat centers we use in, in a few different countries, and then something called integration on the tail end, which is, all right, so you just had this really weird ass experience. How do you interpret that? How do you actually use that in your life and set yourself up for success. I'm assuming that everyone already knows what ayahuasca is, but in case anyone doesn't, it's a plant medicine, right? Um, yep. you, you, you brew it into a tea and then yep. you have a, a pretty intense and profound psychedelic, among other things, therapeutic experience for how many hours? Or I mean, I guess maybe it's case by case for each person, but for it's, a- ca- it's case by case, but on average, it's like four hours and it, it is oh, it's, it's a- indigenous to the Amazon region, and so it goes back uh, in indigenous cultures for you know thousands of years. Like it's been, it's not something that just all of a sudden came about. Similar to mushrooms, you know, mushrooms have been around as long as you know different tribal societies have been around. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, from start to finish, four hours is a good estimate. Yeah. So let's talk about your personal story. So you decided to go to the route of this doing this plant medicine and what why was that 
more effective for you versus all these things you were already doing exercise like what what caused this fundamental change after this experience or what what changes did you see in yourself yeah of course um in terms of the actual mechanisms you know we're we're still trying to figure that out and we're we're doing the best on our side to mm-hmm. figure that out as well um but for me, in terms of the the actual things that I observed and what I saw in other people, is almost immediately it, it felt like my brain worked better. Uh, I don't know if you've ever defragged a computer, but it felt like it defragged my brain. Where before, so defragging is like where you have the you know because you're always saving and deleting and saving and deleting on on your computer, and so it makes the the memory very inefficient because there's a lot of like leftovers and all this other kind of stuff. And so it's like going in and cleaning it out and keeping what you need. And so it was almost like my brain did that as well to where before it just felt like it wasn't working together and actually working counter to its purpose. And then afterwards it almost felt for the first time in a while, like one cohesive unit that wasn't trying to kill me, <laughs> which is good. Uh, You're like neurologically recalibrated. Yeah. I mean, it felt like that, you know, it just felt almost like, like a lot of people say a reset. Um, yeah. And so there, for me, it was really much more of a physical thing. Uh, the, the psycho, I got some like psychological realizations and, and, and messages, but mine was really sort of the, like under the hood, I guess, effects that I felt. Did you find that you had a decrease in anxiety and um, some of those other symptoms you were having? Yeah, increasingly. It just, uh, I never, you know, as with a lot of, you, you still experience it because those are normal human emotions, but they wouldn't be as, it wouldn't get its hooks in me as much as, as it would. Like, I wouldn't go down that, like, anxiety rabbit hole where, you know, there's just no return for a couple of days. Before you got to this point, how did the the Department of Veteran Affairs, like, what treatments did they offer you, and why did you... And how do they fall short in terms of treatment and support? Yeah, so I mean, if if there are veterans listening, you know, I I don't want to dissuade and I don't want to insult the the VA. Like people should go there and, you know, it's for most veterans. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, the people that are doing the best they can and it's just a huge bureaucracy and, you know, just kind of a disclaimer, just because I I don't want to frighten people from from getting help. From my experience, uh, I was in Tampa and... You know, it was, it was around that time where I was like, hey, I need, let me at least try to talk to somebody. Maybe that can help me. And so I went there and I talked to a social worker. She was very nice. And I kind of explained my situation. And, you know, the way I explained it, I wasn't on the worst case. You know, I wasn't on the verge of suicide and I wasn't, you know, about to lose it or anything like that. So it was, it was definitely manageable. But I also told her I wasn't willing to go on uh, medication. So like antidepressants, anti anxiety, just a personal choice. Um, and, so she said, well, we can maybe get you a therapist, but unless you're willing to do the full protocol, which includes talk therapy and the, the, the medication, that there's only so much they can help with because they have so many patients, they have so few doctors that if somebody's not willing to do the full thing. And so, you know, I, I appreciated her honesty, but I was also kind of left of like, all right, well, I guess I have to figure this out on my own, which is not a great position to be left in, you know? Yeah. So your foundation basically connects veterans to ayahuasca treatments and just also promotes awareness of ayahuasca as another like therapeutic modality that they can, they should know about. What are the legal hurdles here? Like, is, is, is there any, like, how does this work legally? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's, we're definitely a full on operating in, in some gray zones, but, you know, we, we might as well stretch out in that. Uh, but, yeah, and so ayahuasca and, and sometimes other psychedelic therapies, too. They're, you know, for, for certain reasons, I, I prefer ayahuasca really tends to help uh, veterans in particular. Uh, but, you know. Oh, no. Okay. So start over at, uh, you were talking about the legal hurdles. Yep. Yeah, start over there. Yeah, so what I'm saying is there, it's there's a lot of gray zone, and so we're we're definitely taking advantage of as much gray zone as as, as we possibly can. Um, for for people that don't know, you know, all these psychedelics, ayahuasca, DMT, psilocybin, 
you know, cannabis still, they're all schedule one, which is the most restrictive of, of drugs. And so that really limits even research, which is pretty crazy. Um, and so in the U S outside of there's certain religious exemptions, but even that is kind of gray area. And so the way we so far have been operating and it might be to our benefit that we're still small, but we operate in countries where it is allowed. Uh, so places where it comes from Peru, Colombia, um, even like Costa Rica, uh, they all have indigenous exemptions. And so because it comes from a cultural heritage Uh, And so there's retreats that have been operating for 20 years, all this kind of stuff. Um, And so it's not my organization that's actually giving them these substances. We are just connecting them to places. Yeah, exactly. And so you financially like sponsor these veterans, right? Right. We provide like financial grants uh, because unfortunately mental health, tends to come or mental issues tend to come with financial instability as well. Um, you know, a lot of these people are living off disability and just hard for them to, to maintain or to get motivated. So, you know, we, we provide sort of the, the, the coaching and then also for those that need it, uh, financial grants as, as much as possible. For all of these psychedelic, you know, medicines, um, whether it be MDMA or ayahuasca, mushrooms, LSD, I feel like, there's enough of a movement to say that these things are valuable for people in a therapeutic and like medicinal context. Why do you think it's so hard to change stigma around these drugs? I think that's a magic question. You know, I think there, there's a few different means and they're all not necessarily great. Uh, but like what you're seeing with cannabis, like cannabis, I think across the country, unless you go into like some very like certain areas, I think the vast majority of people will agree that there is potentially some medical value to cannabis besides for, you know, a few people there, but the fact that it's still extremely hard to even research it is just showing you. But as you're seeing with cannabis, the thing that's actually starting to change now is that now there is a financial or economic incentive to pursue this. And so that's why now it's almost getting facts tracked. And so that's sort of the difficulty with with psychedelics or even with cannabis to begin with, because a lot of these are plant-based or they're not patentable, then it's very hard for, and it's not necessarily bad on Pfizer. Like you can understand it from a economic standpoint, how much they're lobbying against it is its own question, but it just doesn't make sense for them to invest tens to a hundred of millions of dollars to get this through FDA trials for something that is open source. You know, and so they're not going to invest all this money that they're going to lose. Um, and then on the government side, you it's it's a power play for them. You know, like the yeah. the the people who are in charge of reclassifying the drugs, it's Congress technically, but they defer to the DEA. Yeah. And the DEA's budget has expanded like crazy since they started the war on drugs. And so why would they change their budgeting to... You know, like, why would they like, oh, we're going to shrink our offices for the, the, the greater good. I don't know. It's just it's just all these mechanisms that work against each other. And so even like the drug classification, it's this weird catch 22 where the, the classification is it has no medicinal value and that it's ex- extremely addictive. And so psychedelics don't fall under either of those. But the only way you can change that is to have appropriate amount of research, which is a ton of research to prove that neither of those are the case, but it's virtually impossible to do that research because it's schedule one. And so there's no federal funding. Universities are prohibitive. Just the, the mere met the, the near, like what you have to go through to actually study it just costs tens of millions of dollars. You have to get like secure safes. You have to go through like three locked doors just to get like, pure MDMA or what have you. So it's, it's, that's the reason why there hasn't been, despite all the evidence towards it, that it's just been on lockdown. Right. Okay. So this is, this is looking bleak. Um, by the way, what, what administration was responsible for um, the classification of the, the psychedelic drugs as um, I think it started, I mean, there's always kind of been a war on drugs 
at some level in the government. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, I mean, so you even, so you have like the reefer madness uh, kind of era in the thirties and that was, you know, pushed by the government in a lot of ways to, you know, divide like ethnic communities and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. The the current war on drugs, if I'm not mistaken, I think really started with uh, the Nixon administration, just another uh, addition to his, (laughs) to what he's, what he's helped this country out with. Uh, but the vast, like most presidents have been continuing it on. So, you know, the, the, Absolutely. yeah, I think that the, I, even for myself personally growing up, you know, I used to think, uh, uh, of drugs as just, you know, in this re- recreational context that they're just used for partying and escapism. And by the way, I've used plenty of drugs, but, um, yeah. It's just really fascinating when you change the framework and what you look at drugs, even, you know, things like ketamine, MDMA, and you put them in these medicinal, you know, context, how valuable they are. And it's just so unfortunate that we've criminalized them to this point and stigmatized them to this point where it's almost like there's no return to ever get them to be researched and looked at in this, in the light that they should have been originally, you know? Yeah. You, yeah, you feel like a criminal if, if you're even like in the same room as them, you know, like if somebody has like, Oh, look at that person over there. Yeah. Um, and obviously there's, but, there's obviously sorry. a lot of addiction issues that need to be addressed, but I'm just saying in general, it's just sad that there's not more funding for, for, for research and they're not um, available for people that that need them, you know? The One of the things we, we have been trying to do is that, you know, the first step is at least, I think most of the country can agree to promote research. It's yeah. one of those things, even if you are against cannabis and against psychedelics and you think they're the most dangerous thing, research is just gonna prove your point right. So why not, let's all let scientists and researchers do their job and figure out what's, what's actually here. If, you know, I'm, I'm the first, if, if to my absolute complete surprise, I find out that ayahuasca is, is the most horrible thing and research beyond a doubt proves that, then I will admit that, you know, I don't want to subject veterans to that. And, you know, we, we're currently actually working with two major U S universities. And one of the hard part is even just with all the stigma to get funding around the research we're doing it is it's so hard to get traction on that which is such a weird notion in any you know advanced society to want to not know more about something that has huge upside i haven't done ayahuasca and um i wanted to actually talk about ayahuasca just for anyone who's listening who is interested and maybe don't, doesn't know much about it um for me personally I've always wanted to do it. I haven't necessarily had that moment when I felt like called to just go out and do it. I'm very interested and I'm very curious, but I'm also very scared. (laughs) And I know that uh, there's a lot of fear attached to it as with other psychedelics. You know, I think before I tried mushrooms for the first time and, and, uh, and acid, I was very scared too. How do you prepare people to kind of let go of those fears before they decide to to do it? Or do you think that they're already in a place where they're like, well, I have nothing to lose. Let's just, let's get it done. No, I mean, hopefully hopefully you get to them before that stage. You don't want to get to the nothing to lose stage uh, too much. Um, But I think, I think you're actually, I think you're actually doing it in the appropriate manner. And, you know, when you do come to that point where you want to do it, you know, uh, let me know and can help you prepare and all that kind of stuff. But it it is really the whole practice of using (laughs) the whole practice of using psychedelics is in one dynamic, getting more in tune to your intuition, getting more in tune to what your subconscious is telling you, because that's where a lot of these suppressed emotions and and issues are coming from on, on some levels of you're just not listening to yourself. You're not seeing what, uh, causes, the reaction and so if your body or some part of your intuition is telling you like you know maybe not right now these things 
do tend to find you. It does, things tend to line up when it's the right time and you're in the right spot. Uh, you know, if, if, if things are too chaotic or you're just not feeling right, then it might not be the best time. And I just say respect that. In terms of the fear dynamic, I mean, it is, it's kind of what you're alluding to before. There's, there's sort of the difference of taking it recreationally and taking it with intention. And, you know, no, no fault on to each their own if, if you want to do it recreationally. I only just say know what you're, why you're taking it. If you're just taking it for that purpose, know that's why you're taking it. But if you're taking it for sort of the therapeutic or the deeper understanding, then go into it with that, with that, with that intention, with that preparation. And no matter what, there's going to be a fear element because one, it's relinquishing control on some levels, but two, it is facing some serious things that you have purposely suppressed for quite a while. And you wouldn't have suppressed these things if they're easy to deal with. And so psychedelics allow you that tool, even if it can be difficult and very hard to address those, to possibly overcome those in a weird, you know, dreamlike or alternate reality sort of state where it works more in metaphors and it works more in, in visuals and emotions and feelings, uh, which is exactly what you need. It's, it's almost working on a, what I say, like the, the subconscious speaks a different language and we're not, if, if you don't practice it, then you don't understand the language. And so psychedelics are almost like the translator to linking your conscious mind, your, your, your thought process, the over analytical side to this subconscious where it's more based on emotion. It's more based on music. It's more based on poetry. Yeah. And those, those don't necessarily speak the same language. That was a great way of putting that. Um, so do you, these programs that you set bets up with, are there, is there just a shaman or is there also other trained professionals there? How, what's the, what's the, the structure of this look like? So, so like, let's say someone has a moment where they're dealing with something really traumatic. Are they just, do they work with the shaman to just kind of, stay grounded or how does that how do, what does that look like when someone is going through like a traumatic moment yeah i mean it, that that is really why i'm part of our biggest job is finding places that we trust and have know what they're doing you know unfortunately as it is getting more popular and you know even people with the best intentions might go to peru and might do like a six month crash course and then come back and say like oh i'm a shaman this is great here it goes but, you know, there can be, and that generally psychedelics do the heavy lifting. And so a lot of people can get away with that for a while, but it's, it's those hard cases or those unique cases that you really need to have experience. And from the, the indigenous traditions, you know, the, these shamans, curaderos from the, the, the tribes, they've been working with these since they're kids, since teenagers for decades. And it's, it's all about working with people, different, different, uh, traumas and you know it really depends on what you believe and from their perspective uh but at the end of the day too it's it's really experience and especially with uh like veterans it can be a very intense sort of trauma and so generally like the ones we work with they have a shaman or two there and in the ayahuasca process part of it is they sing these songs called ikaros and uh those are uh, songs they learned through their own journey, through uh, doing these experiences with various plants in the Amazon. And the, the it's interesting when you go into it because the songs almost guide your journey in, in a very surreal way. Um, and so they use the songs to help people get through. Uh, but generally, for the most part, it's on the person. Like if they're struggling, then that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's like a, yeah. it's almost like a deep tissue massage where they're like really kneading into it, you know? Like sometimes you really have to hit that hard before you learn yeah exactly and but if if it gets to the point where you know what you'd say like a freak out or they're just like i need help or whatever that's where you need like the trained people the facilitators the facilitators generally are not shaman themselves but they've worked with people and then the shaman can also go over and just uh, either you know like do a prayer or guide them or just you know calm them down and that from every experience i've seen gets them through it you know at the end of the day it's also the prep work. Like if people have a little bit more understanding of what they're getting into and some tools and then it can help them because 
if you just kind of like dive in, then you're always like, oh, is this right? Am I having a reaction? Like, what's going on? But if they know, like, even if they think it's horrible that everything's going to be okay in a few hours at some level, then they're just like, oh, this sucks, this sucks. But they'll continue pushing on. But yeah, to, to that, there is methods in the indigenous tradition and experience going into it to where even people that are having really bad experiences. Mm -hmm. So have you, um, have you seen that show Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia? It's on HBO and Viceland. Yeah, I haven't seen every single one, but I've seen a lot of them. Well, anyway, his, his show, it's, it's for anyone listening, it's led by this guy, Hamilton Morris, um, where he just goes and kind of, uh, talks about the history and also tries all these like rare drugs all over the world. But he, he was really helpful in reframing what I thought um, a bad trip was. And we have this idea of a bad trip being this really scary, awful thing, which sometimes it can be. But, you know, sometimes those really challenging and difficult moments that are really painful are, are exactly what you need. So, and, and when you look at it that way, it's really not a bad trip. It's just the trip that you needed in that time. And I feel like that's kind of what all of any, any of my peers who have tried ayahuasca have said, they're like, if it's the most difficult thing you've ever been through, it's because you, you needed it and it's going to be, it's going to pay off. Um, and so that's something that's definitely helped me be less fearful about it. And I think, um, cause you know, you get scared if you have been through something traumatic, it's going to come up. And yep. I, think, I think knowing that, yeah, it's not permanent and that that is, it's going to be the best thing for you in the end is, is, is good. So after veterans go through your program, what's, what are the changes you're seeing? Are, is it successful? Are people coming out being like, thank you, thank you, thank you? Or some people being like, ah, that didn't really work or what, what's the deal? Yeah. So uh, on your, on your previous point to, I've, I've had uh, like veterans, like a, a buddy who was an army ranger and had over 15 deployments under his belt. And one of his or two of his experiences were from his definition, the, the hardest thing he's ever had to experience. And this is coming from a guy who's, you know, experienced quite a lot in terms of hardship, but within that there was, um, benefits at the end of it. Um, and that's not to scare people off, but uh, to your point, you know, like, it, it's, like if it's an easy workout versus a hard workout, which one do you think you're going to get more out of? Sometimes there does need to be a little bit of a, a friction point. And oftentimes the friction points are exactly those spots that we don't want to address and that we've done very well of burying. And so it's going to take some effort and it's going to take some hitting walls with your head a few times before you like realize that that's not the way you have to go. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, unless, unless I'm just a crazy masochist, so the reason I keep doing this and the reason I, I dedicate so much time to this, uh, because, you know, all of our team, it's all volunteer. We don't get any money from this, but it's because of the results. Yeah. And as, as uphill of a battle as it can be, it's like every time I see of that and every time I see like a complete life transformation, it's one of those reaffirming, Okay. Do it. Keep going. This, this is, yeah, exactly. It's, and you need that, like you need some sort of valid uh, validation, I guess. Uh, yeah. So especially more as we've developed the program, uh, the more that we've gotten comfortable with the preparation and post integration, the results have been much, much more. And even from the get go, it was all positive. Uh, last year, I think we did an internal poll of, of some of the vets that we sent. And this went out to, at that time, over 30, 35 vets. And it was just kind of a quick, non-scientific, simple survey. And one of the questions was, is your, has your life improved since your ayahuasca experience? And across the board, 100% of the people said yes. Um, and so, awesome. uh, and, you know, like I think you mentioned before, it, it, everybody's different. It's, there's no guaranteed results. It's not like you're just going to go here and boom, you're going to be done. And we try to get away from that, that magic pill thinking. Yeah, but, definitely not. Yeah, and, and, and so from the small side, you know, even, even minor benefits can be huge down the line. So some people might not have, a lot of people don't have like the super profound, like all of a sudden I believe in Jesus now or whatever. That's, that's kind of a rare thing and not really necessary either. 
but some people just have like a better understanding of what their trauma is doing to them, what they're what it's doing to other people. Um, a lot of people will come out with this almost like zooming out like perspective to where they can see themselves in a third person or just see it in a bigger array of, of life in general. And so with that, like if you're having an attack or you're having anxiety and you can zoom out, that's actually a very powerful tool. And then on the, the, the other side, like we, we worked with like a green beret and uh, a story I like to tell is he, he went from the most intimidating, like six foot three, six foot four, man a few words green beret giant guy to almost like a a, a, a goofy like hippie <laughs> towards the end i mean he was still like the military guy uh but he was just much more laid back carefree and he told me a story afterwards that like when he got back he was like excited to call me and tell me he had this amazing morning with his son who was 10 years old and so his son had only seen the military side of him because he had been in the army for that long and this was the first time that he enjoyed and bonded with his son ever making pancakes because before he'd be on the edge and like worried about missing the bus or whatever. And so he's just saying like, it was a magical kind of thing. And his son was skeptical at first. He was like, who, what, what happened to you in the jungle? Uh, but yeah. that's, that's the power of this because it's, it's multi-generational, you know, it, uh, obviously it's great. It, it helped his life and, you know, helped him become regain parts of who he is, but that, relationship with his son and with his wife is going to last through the son's life and it's probably going to help him have better relationships down the line yeah totally yeah there's you definitely have to be cautious with all of these things and you have to really know why you're doing them to get the most out of them yeah for for people who are like curious a lot of psychedelics really are like everything enhancers sensory enhancers which includes emotions and so if you're going to take psychedelics you kind of have to ask yourself like if your emotions were dialed up you know a few and if your senses in terms of like sight and sound were dialed up is this a setting do you want to be in uh that's why people prefer sort of the calm music or serene and not a lot of change because you are hypersensitive to almost everything including emotional input so that's why if you have somebody, you know, that's why they say a lot of bad trips happen if somebody else is freaking out because then you almost absorb that and then it causes you to question. So if you're thinking about it, you know, take that of like, if everything's dialed up a few notches, is this a spot you want to be in? Yeah, I think your environment is extremely uh, important. I think that you should feel safe. What's the best way we can advocate to make these tools accessible? for the people that need them, even in, even in restricted settings? Like how, how, how do you think the best way to go about doing that is? The, I mean, the way we always preach is, you know, we try, a lot of people come from, especially ayahuasca or major psychedelic experiences and they want to like push everybody to it and be like, I, you should take this, you should take this. Uh, but I don't think that's the best way. I think it's really sort of the practice what you preach. Like if you are actually benefiting from them and you are have a changed life, people will notice that, like especially people close to you. And so be the advocate in that way and then just be a information resource. So like if people want to talk about it, don't talk their ear off, but like present what you found and present resources like maps uh, uh, to self-promote heroic hearts. You know, even our social media, we're always doing news and reach out to these different organizations and they can learn more and just be that advocate. Uh, I, I really think that's sort of the best way. And, you know, there's a lot of different communities and in different areas. And so if advocacy is what you're doing. The company, uh, Dr. Bronner's has really been putting a lot of money be behind like some decrim movements and yeah, really, they're, they're actually one of the, the original people that one of the original companies that actually uh, prom that helped us that they gave us like a grant early on. And they've just been, they've been awesome. They've been one of the power horses behind the psychedelic movements. And it's just a really awesome company in terms of sustainability, in terms of uh, corporate responsibility and giving their, their proceeds. And so not to like straight plug them, they never asked this, but just because they've been so helpful, they actually, this is like a new like campaign. And so they actually were going to be on the like, the bottle at the bottom there. I think it's right there. So that's kind of a cool, I've never been on a, a soap bottle before. That's, so that's a that's pretty major. Another res, 
<laughs> another resume builder for me, put on my LinkedIn profile. But yeah, they, they've, they've been amazing. Um, to get to your original like question, it's try to find local communities, try to support it. There is a lot of movements there. And then just really connecting people that are struggling, you know, like we, we're taking the veteran approach because I do believe, you know, myself being a veteran, but also it is one of the more effective ways to bridge the gap because obviously there is a, um, a marketing aspect to psychedelics where you have to get it past the stigma of like hippie or, or new age or whatever. And, you know, veterans, especially healing are that sort of bridge to, different demographics of the population in terms of you see a Navy SEAL, a Green Beret, you know, they're going to talk to more conservative people and just be like, Hey, this, I know it's weird, but this psychedelic saved my life. And I think that is one of the most powerful ways. And so that's really in terms of the marketing side or outreach side, that's the way we're trying to play it and push it and just get more attention around it. Totally. Yeah. Veterans are so loved in this country. I feel like if that doesn't convince people, you know, what will? Yeah, exactly. I promise you I don't, like, I'm listening. I think I have large ear holes because <laughs> these keep falling out. I don't know what's going on. You okay. need to get extra large earbuds? I either need to get extra large earbuds or I need to get surgery to make my ear holes smaller. I'm not sure which one. Yeah, the, the the ear surgery is definitely the better way to go. That's yeah, definitely, definitely. I was thinking for sure that way. <laughs> you can be you can be like the like the the trendsetter on that. Like a whole ripple of ear surgeries will follow from this podcast. You've heard about breast augmentation, but <laughs> about ear hole surgery. Yeah, I feel like based on what you said, it, it, until there's like a major business opportunity. <laughs> surrounding these things that just things won't change because that's just how it kind of is it's not people unfortunately see value when there's profit attached so yeah i mean and to to maybe give like a light at the end of the tunnel just so it's not like so bleak is i mean that's that's kind of what we're trying to do like we, we're not you know we're a non-profit and just through the story through the you know, testimonials, I think we can also have more of that grassroots support. And as opposed to trying to get the Congress to change it, the more veterans we get and the more veteran attention we get, then that builds community support that puts pressure on the system from that ground level. And so, you know, through our program, we, we also have like this ambassador program that we've recently started. And it's exactly for that to build these hubs in local areas in Vegas, LA, where there are, where there is a veteran presence, but then there's also civilians and professionals that are looking for ways to help. And so, you know, our, our, our goal with it is to have a more sustainable local level community that gets away from the divisiveness and really with the, the mission to you know, support veterans, but then within that also support the rest of the community of anybody else that is looking to explore these. And so that's kind of how we're trying to push it forward. You know, it, it takes the time and a lot of these things will take time, but it is moving forward. There is getting momentum and, you know, there is that economic side of it, but I do think a lot of the psychedelic in the, the people in the psychedelic world are learning from some of the missteps of the cannabis uh, movement and trying to make different steps. So even maps again, you know, they have the nonprofit and they have the for public uh, for the public benefit corporation. And so, you know, they hold, there's no patent for MDMA, but they'll hold the intellectual property of how to do MDMA therapy. And they have that so that when they are, when it is passed through the FDA in a year or two, then they can give, they can maintain an affordable treatment for those that need it. Um, as opposed to it going to a big pharmaceutical company and becoming, you know, a hundred thousand dollars for a treatment. There we go. That's a, that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. You guys take donations, right? Yes, we do. Funny. You should mention that. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, if, if people want to support us like financially, it is all financial, it all, all donation based <laughs> and, no, and none of us, I, my, uh, I don't ears. What's that? Your ears. It first to my fund to get my ears. Uh, yeah, we'll have the we'll have the go the ear reduction GoFundMe first, and then the rest of the proceeds can can go to us. To you, yeah, that's right. 
So yeah, so it is it is donation based. None of the money the money goes directly to the vets. None of us get money, um, and it's through our website heroicheartsproject.org. There's the Patreon. You know, if if you are interested in giving us money, it's it's pretty easy to do it out there. And then if people are interested in supporting just through time or or, or work or professional expertise, they have the ambassador program that they can find on our website as well. I'm gonna do that. Yeah. Do I, I don't know. I don't know if I have any professional training to help, but I would love to help. I'll look at it. It's, a, it's civilian. It's civilian and professional. You know, it doesn't have to be professional. Can add one dynamic, but you know, just people that are interested in helping it. You know, it it, it goes a long way. Me. Once once you once you recover from your surgery, then. <laughs> <laughs> so heroicheartsproject.org. dot org. Heroic heroics heart heart. Oh, exactly. Heroichartsproject.org. See, by making it harder to say, people have to repeat it, and then that's just extra publicity. Yeah. It's all <laughs> very well thought out. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. I'm, I'm so fascinated, and I'm just so happy that people like you you're, you're doing. So. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, and, and thank you again for everything and the platform.